let's make sure slides will be switching. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Today, myself and three other wonderful people will be presenting about the injustices faced by individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD. So to begin, my name is Michelle Rayton, and I am a first year YLC member. I am Margot Mealy. I'm an incoming co-chair. My name is Jack Mayer, and I am a Best Buddies Global Ambassador. I'm Kelly Howard, and I'm Best Buddy Global Ambassador as well. So I wanted to provide a bit of background on what the YLC actually is. So the Young Leaders Council is a diverse group of individuals of all abilities who bridge the gap between the student perspective and staff experience for Best Buddies International Initiatives. We conceptualize, design, and execute unique initiatives that apply to all aspects of the Best Buddies ecosystem, friendship, leadership, jobs, and inclusive living. Best Buddies Ambassadors is a program that provides training for participants with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, in areas of speech writing, public speaking, and self-advocacy. The ambassador program prepares people to become an advocate agent of change and inform engaging advocacy for those disability rights movements. So part of understanding how individuals with disabilities are seen in society is learning about the history of this group and how they've been treated in the past. In colonial America, caring for people with disabilities was often made into a responsibility of the town. Since most families couldn't actually afford to house these individuals, they were usually placed in poor farms along with criminals and the impoverished. These facilities were extremely overcrowded and very dirty. Beginning in the late 1700s, European hospitals introduced moral treatment, since many doctors discouraged physical restraints such as shackles or straitjackets. Instead, they focused on emotional well-being, believing that this approach would cure patients more effectively. So this was clearly a big shift from how they were being treated previously into more um, kind of accepting and, and proper uh, treatment that became more popular in the 1700s. However, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, doctors were also heavily influenced by eugenics, which is the belief that controlling genetics could improve the human race. Now, some doctors, actually practiced forced sterilization on persons they deemed unfit, which uh, removes their ability to have children. Other physicians also performed lobotomies to cut connections between parts of the brain, believing that this operation would significantly reduce mania or what they labeled highly disturbing behavior. And then in 1967, the first ugly law passed in San Francisco, which made it illegal for any person with a severe physical disability to show themselves in public. So this included deformities, limping, or any other signs of illness. Um, all those were kind of a cause for being fined or being placed into an institution. This forced many families who had a child with a disability to keep them hidden away or get sent to an institution to be forgotten since they were viewed in society at this time as an embarrassment. By the 1900s, many hospitals stopped practicing moral treatment because state legislators decided that the cost of these programs uh, was actually more than they were willing to spend. Hospital superintendents instead chose to focus on research and new medical treatments, uh, including electroshock therapy, where electric shocks are passed through the brains of patients, and hydrotherapy, which ranged from extremely hot baths to painfully strong showers. In 1907, the Immigration Act was introduced. So this uh, essentially stated that individuals that were found to have an intellectual or physical disability that affected their ability to earn a living, they were not allowed to enter the country, even if they were trying to enter with family members. And at the start of the 1920s, electroconvulsive therapy and dietary restrictions became uh, kind of the common form of treatment for symptoms of autism. In 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed, which permitted employers to pay lower wages to employees whose productivity was limited due to a physical or intellectual disability. During the 1950s and 60s, thousands of lobotomies were performed. 
And by the early 1970s, shock therapy, as well as aversive punishment became the mainstream autism treatment approach. And now I say treatment in quotes, because of course, you know, there isn't necessarily anything to be treated, um, but this was at the time where, you know, they were trying to, um, they had very negative views towards any sort of mental or physical disability. Fortunately, towards the end of the 1970s, pharmaceutical treatments became the new norm for um, kind of helping, um, you know, treat quote unquote autism. Um, so they kind of left these like cruel um, forms of therapy behind. So I wanted to kind of touch a little bit about um, the about the legal use of shock treatment. So in March 2020, electric shock devices that are designed to cause physical pain were banned by the uh, FDA. However, on the 6th of July um, in 2021, this was this ban was overturned in support of the doctors that were abusing students in the Judge Rodenberg Educational Center in Massachusetts. So former students have you know, bravely spoken out about the abuse that they faced while attending this uh, center, the JRC. One student actually detailed their experience of being restrained to a chair every single day for two months as a form of punishment, um, in addition to repeated shocks or behavior, uh, as minor as you know, speaking out of turn or maybe standing up when you know, they weren't specifically um, told to do so. So these electric shocks are used to torture students in this facility. Um, and they have been deemed unsafe for able people, uh, as well as even animals. Um, but somehow they're still legally being used to correct natural behaviors people with disabilities exhibit, specifically, but not limited to um, unwanted autistic traits. So these students wear a device attached to an arm or leg, which delivers shocks whenever staff believes a behavior should be corrected. As of right now, it is approved for use on 55 disabled adults, which is 55 too many. Those that began receiving shocks as children, uh, they needed parental consent, but the JRC, what they do is they use court appointed guardianships to get power over an individual um, um, so that they're able to successfully go through with this. These are non-consensual non guardianships um, that remove personal freedom over where one can reside and forces them to go wherever instructed, as well as receive whatever treatment that uh, appointed guardian wants. So, it is clear that this is legal, ableist torture that's still happening today. Michelle, thank you so much for um, the history um, of how we started and where we're going and where we keep going. Um, that I think that's really important. Um, hi everyone, I'm Margo. Um, I'm going to be talking um, with you all today about the realities of dating for individuals with disabilities. Um, and I will also be sharing my personal experience with you. Tinder, Bumble, Hinge. I am done swiping to find love. Hi, my name is Margo Mealy. I'm 33 years old. I am here to share my personal experience as both a woman and as a person with a, with a disability about the struggles and realities of dating. I have discovered as a single woman on the dating scene that many who express interest in me have poor dating etiquette, which is my opinion the polite way to say it. The, this presents unique issues for me when I reveal my disability on my dating profile or if it comes up in conversation when getting to know each other or on the first date. Etiquette, read my profile. Read my profile before sending a message. It takes less than a minute or if not more to skim a dating profile. I am disabled, but I am not, but I am, not meant to be your inspiration. Do the work. If you receive my message and you can tell they they have not read your profile, let it go on, but not for any length of time. It needs it needs to, and then cut ties. Jokes and ref jokes are references. When sexual references are made, it comes off as they are only looking for sex and not 
and not the whole person. Using sexual jokes or icebreakers is a definite no-no. No one should be objected that way. No naughty or unsolicited pictures, please. If you aren't going to send it to your grandma on a holiday card, I do not want to see it either. Remember, if you do not like something, then call them out on it. They are If they aren't respecting your boundaries, then it is time to say bye-bye. Stop making inappropriate, stop Stop asking inappropriate questions. If you are not going to ask your mom, boss, or that pesky coworker you are not a fan of, then consider the question you are about to ask highly inappropriate. There is nothing wrong in being curious, but many, but many dating, but many dating seekers aren't always aware of natural curiosity and being and being invasive those personal questions can be asked at as this time goes on Use your voice. If something is making you absolutely uncomfortable, then you have the right to say something. If they don't respect that, then say bye-bye and move on. Equal treatment. Treat me, treat me like all the other abled women you approach. If you can't see me as equal partners, then do not waste my time. Repeat, if you can't see me as an equal partner, then do not waste my time. Save the inspirational messages. We get that on a daily basis. Tr trust us as you would from the hundreds of others you have approached. Just because we may move, talk, or, th or think differently doesn't mean they need to treat us differently. We are looking for a partner, not a personal care assistant. Don't ghost. Ghosting on anyone is just plain rude. I would rather I would rather them realize that we are not compatible and be honest and say something rather than receiving a text message three days later with no valid explanation or at all or not show up at the date spot that was agreed upon. I would rather know the truth than be left in space. Take me as I am. This is the most important rule of all. Take me as I am. I am not here to change myself for your satisfaction. Love me as I am. or I Love me as I am or not at all. I'm not your ex or Beyonce. So if you handle what I bring to the table, then let me go to someone else who can appreciate my unique qualities. Be yourself. Whether you are funny, a coffee lover, dog or cat person show up as your quirky self don't hide someone out there is looking to find you safety as a woman with disability safety is important i'd like to share my personal experience with you i have many friends now um, some um, are college age students. Um, some are women that I've met along my life journey. Um, some are coworkers. Um, some have just we've crossed paths with and we just connect. Some are cousins. Some are just far away friends. And safety and dating for any of those individuals, regardless if they have a disability or not an IDD at all is really important. And so that is why I'm sharing my experience, not only as a woman, but as a woman with a disability. I was 19. I had begun taking non-degree courses at a community college. I was still living with my mom. Um, she was suffering um, really bad 
episode with addiction. But while I was taking classes, I had encountered um, this lovely gentleman. Um, he took me out on dates, took me to dinners. Um, we exchanged notes for class. We had conversations. One night, he and his roommates, who one of them had been mutual friends from another class, invited me to their apartment for a party. I said, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, he, his personality had, had kind of changed um, recently before the party. And so, you know, I kind of agreed to go to the party just to be polite. Um, I walked in, uh, it was outside. It was a nice spring, summer, summer night. So we were all outside. Um, we had been conversing with, you know, our different friend groups that were there. Um, but I hadn't seen him. Um, I hadn't seen the guy that I was um, involved with. And um, I had just kept looking out to see if I would spot him. Um, I finally spotted him getting a drink um, up on the deck. So I walked up the steps. Um, I said, hey, hon, how are you? You know, how are you having a good night? You know, just checking in. Because, um, you know, I thought you started a conversation. Um, he kind of had a Jekyll Hyde persona going on. He was really kind to me at first. Um, then I realized that he was sloppy drunk. Um, he then got verbally abusive. Uh, he pushed me along the deck where the like top of the railing is. Um, he said some really hurtful things. Um, then he got physically abusive. He then pushed me off the deck. I land, luckily I landed on my butt, my hands out of course, because I was trying to spot myself safely but you don't want to fall anyway. Um, I dusted myself off, got up. People started talking again, minding their business. I walked up the, the steps. I walked up the steps of the deck um, and walked back in the house because I understood, hey, you know, I, I'm done. I need to go home. I walked further in the apartment to get to the front door. I was almost to the front door before I got pulled into his bedroom. I said, I put my hands up. I said, I really need to go home. You're making me really uncomfortable. I need to go home. By the time I got into his bedroom, he pushed me on the bed. He climbed on top of me. Guy's feet are very smelly and uh, he had a gym sock or something on the floor and so he shoved it in my mouth so I, I would stop screaming. But I knew no one was gonna hear me. It was a party, there was loud music, there was loud chatter. No one was gonna hear me regardless if I was yelling help, I wanna go home. I'm sure that you can imagine the next sentence that I'm gonna tell you. I was a victim of date rape. I he finally let me go, uh, told me to get out. Um, so of course I did the walk of shame quietly, of course. Um, I finally made it home. My mom was in no position to have this kind of conversation. Um, so I just locked myself in my room for the rest of the weekend. When I got to school on Monday, our mutual friend that's um, my ex's um, roommate at the time um, asked me why he didn't see me at the rest of the party. I said, um, I, just, just, I just went home. I'm just uncomfortable talking about it. Then all of a sudden I just laid out everything on the table and told him what occurred before I went home. He apologized. He asked me if I was going to the police. I said, I said, honestly, I'm still debating. 
it was 2007. There was, at that time, there was a lot of conversation in the media about whether someone with an IDD and dating asked to be treated that way. And I didn't feel the need that I needed to go to the police. I kind of relied on karma. About a year and a half or so later, I'm in another apartment. My mom has passed away. I randomly got an email from this from this girl trying to meet me, trying to find out my story. She finally explained herself as to why. She got together with the same guy. Um, she has cerebral palsy, so she's in a wheelchair. She's confined to her wheelchair. Um, and she told to me that um, she encountered the same behavior from him, that she was raped. I finally got in my head that I didn't need to be quiet about it, that I didn't that I, that I, that I just didn't need to be quiet about it. I, I could, I could finally open up. I finally realized that I was no longer a victim, that I was a survivor. She told me the reason also why she emailed me and why she wanted to know my story was because her parents had asked her to file a report with the police and take him to court. I gave a verbal testimony. I recently found out after that, that um, he was charged and I believe he's still currently in jail. Um, but yeah, that's my personal experience. Um, I'm really sorry um, in advance if that, if that is triggering to, to anyone else. Um, for me, sometimes it's triggering still. Um, other days I'm able to talk about it and it's a little more fluid. Um, so I just want to put that out there for myself that, that I apologize if that's triggering. Um, but again, safety is extremely important to me. I would want to be that friend that you text at whatever time of day if you're having a problem with a man. I want to be that friend. I want to be that safety net. I want to make sure that you are that that you know that you're valid if you ever feel like you are not in a safe situation call someone tell someone call 911 if needed at the end of the day your safety is most important thank you margo for um, sharing that personal experience. I know that it can be extremely difficult to talk about those types of things. Um, and as you said, like some days it's easier, some days it's hard, um, but it's so brave of you to uh, speak so openly about what has happened to you in, in hopes of um, kind of um, empowering other people and, and making people aware of, you know, like you said, the realities of dating and, and you know, everybody has to be careful. So thank you for taking the time to um, share that with everyone. So, uh, you know, we, we do wanna take um, a bit of uh, a change in direction and highlight some of the positive that has happened, um, despite, you know, obviously all the negatives that do exist. Um, there has been, you know, improvements since then um, in terms of uh, how people with disabilities um, are being treated. So in 1946, the National Mental Health Foundation helped expose the abusive conditions that state institutions um, were, were kind of implementing on people with disabilities. And they became an early advocate for um, you know, these individuals to live in the community instead. Eight years later in 1954, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation uh, provided funds for over 100 university-based rehab programs. At the time, this was a huge step for the disability community. Then at the start of the 1970s, uh, WGBH, which is a public television uh, station in Boston, they actually began providing closed captioned uh, programming for the deaf or hard of hearing. 
1972, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia ruled that the school system couldn't exclude children with disabilities from attending public schools. In the same year, the District Court for Eastern Pennsylvania shut down a number of state laws that were doing the same thing. These rulings inspired, uh, these rulings worked to inspire the passing of the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. A year later, the Rehabilitation Act was passed, which intended to prohibit discrimination in federally funded programs and services. A few years later, there was actually a massive sit-in demonstration by disability rights activists, uh, and it was held to fight the inaccessibility of the mass transit system. So participants blocked the Denver Regional Transit Authority buses for a whole year, which eventually forced the Transit Authority to invest in wheelchair lift buses. By 1987, Anthony Kennedy Shriver founded the original Best Buddies chapter at Georgetown University. Two years later, Best Buddies became America's first national unified social and recreational program for people with intellectual disabilities. Then on July 26, 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, prohibiting discrimination towards those with a disability and guaranteeing that they have the same opportunities as everyone else. Uh, which included employment opportunities, the ability to purchase goods and services, as well as access to participate in state or local programs and services. A thousand activists with disabilities marched from the White House to the Capitol uh, building to demand the passing of this bill. Around 60 activists actually abandoned their mobility aids and physically crawled up the entrance steps to symbolize the barriers that they face. In 1993, Best Buddies Canada was established by Daniel Greenglass and Penny Shore and was incorporated as a registered Canadian charity in 1995. By 2003, Best Buddies had participants in all 50 states and on six continents. In 2006, the first bill was passed that required students in the kindergarten to grade 12 public school system to be taught the history of the disability rights movement. And as we mentioned before, it's really important to understand this history. So it puts into perspective of, you know, how uh, we started off and, and how far we've actually come. Then in 2009, Rose's Law, uh, which was introduced on November, November 17th, replaced instances of mental retardation in legislation with intellectual disability. Uh, this as well was a huge, huge, huge uh, win for the disability community as the way that we uh, you know, phrase things and the, the words that we use have a great deal of power and moving towards something that's much more um, inclusive was a huge step. Then in 2010, Judy Human became the first person to be appointed by the U.S. State Department's Special Advisor on International Disability Rights by President Obama. However, this was later dismantled in 2017 by the Trump administration. Bodies is the world's largest organization dedicated to ending the social, physical, and economic isolation of the 200 million people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD. Our programs empower the special abilities of people with IDD by helping them form meaningful friendships with their peers, secure successful jobs, live independently, improve public speaking, self-advocacy and communication skills, and feel valued by society. The one-to-one -one friendships are also included in the school system and um, citizen program, meaning we never gray out. But many friendships between, between people with and without IDD, offering social mentoring while improving the quality of life and the level of inclusion. Integrated employment, one of my favorites, <laughs> is secure job for people with IDD and allowing them to earn an income and pay taxes and support themselves, meaning um, they put them in a job where they're most comfortable of what they would like to do for the long run. So I am a social media specialist and I get to work from home. So it's a great, um, a great employment. Leadership development educates and empowers people with and without, e with and without IDD to be leaders and advocates 
in our society for in our society and become leaders to of and and advocates and active members of change. As for inclusive living, it is providing a vibrant integrated living opportunity for people with and without IDD. And as for our Best Buddies mission, the Best Buddies International is a non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to establishing a global volunteer movement that creates opportunities for one-to-one -one friendships, integrated employment, leadership development, and inclusive living for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. As we look at our impact, we have over 2,882 chapters with 69,117 participants and 69,170 people impacted. We are also located in 50 states and 56 countries. As we look at the participants that are employed, there are about 1,581 participants. And as for the yearly wage, yearly, yearly wage earned, it is 21 million or no, $21,112.921. And if we look at some of our one-to-one -one friendships, middle schools, there are 2,724 chapters implemented. High schools have 32,180 chapters. And colleges have 17,484 chapters. Everyone, this is huge. This is what Best Buddies is doing. This is the impact that we are making every single day on individuals with and without IDD and how we can become active members of change. For our involvement section, on an international aspect, Best Buddies offers accredited international programs in 56 countries and territories worldwide. Access to the programs offered with our, our friendship, jobs, leadership development, and inclusive living mission pillars will vary based on region. For more information on regional programs, please email international at bestbuddies.org for international program inquiries. And when we look at our friendship involvement, our friendship programs build one-to-one -one friendships between people with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, offering social interactions while improving the quality of life and level of inclusion for a population that is often isolated and excluded. Through their participation, people with IDD form meaningful connections with their peers and gain self-confidence and self-esteem and it share interest, interest, share interest, experience, and advocacy activities that, that many other individuals enjoy. We are in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, citizens, and anybody. So we are also online. And when we look at our leadership involvement, Chapter leadership are selected at the start of the school year and are trained to support the Best Buddies chapter at their school and support the mission in action. The officer team can be made up of a variety of positions and should be developed to meet the needs of the chapter. Any position that helps promote growth and sustainability for the chapter is encouraged. As for our Best Buddies Ambassadors Program, it, this is a program that provides training for participants with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, in areas of speech writing, public speaking, and self-advocacy. Ambassadors develop the skills to professionally share their life stories, promote Best Buddies programs, network, and most importantly, advocate. The Ambassadors program prepares people to become active agents of change and informed 
engaging advocates for the disabilities right movement. They, a state ambassador is a participant who successfully completed two ambassador training through their state ambassador program in one cal calendar year. The state advocate and determined individual to serve as a state ambassador for a two year term based on benchmark establishment established by each state office individually. Global. Global ambassadors are nominated by each state officer based on their performance at the state ambassador in the meeting on all state ambassador guidelines. These ambassadors are ultimately ultimately chosen to represent the organization for two years term by the Best Buddies Leadership Team in tandem with the state recommendations. So Jack and I, I consider us veterans as Global Ambassadors, and we've accomplished so much in our time. Um, we'll give two stories each, because I'm sure we can go on and on. But my favorite experience being a Global Ambassador, not just sharing our stories and networking and meeting people, and you know, giving the gift of gab. <laughs> However, my favorite experience is winning the Spirit Current Award in 2017. I didn't know it was happening. I remember being there, being excited for leadership conference in Indiana. And next thing you know, Anthony Kennedy Cyber is basically talking about me. And then the whole leadership conference, I just felt like best buddy celebrity that year. Quite an amazing experience. I still hang, have it hanging up on my wall to this day. Uh, and my other favorite experience was being able to go on the all staff cruise. I mean, who would love all you can eat? Hanging out with some of your closest staff members who do so much for us. Getting to have that one on one time with all of them and just remarkable and seeing what they do behind like closed doors and making this program run. I mean, these people do so much for our chapter. Kudos to staff, because they are killing it. And uh, Jack, I'm sure you have a couple of stories as well. Yes, thank you, Kelly. What a remarkable experience you've had with Best Buddies. As for me, my favorite experience being a Best Buddies ambassador would definitely be it's not just like the same thing as Kelly, like it's not just me sharing your life story or doing or doing other other jobs for best buddies. But or, but I would definitely say for on my end, it's just meeting the people and going different places and getting to see uh, the best buddies mission in action at these events. I mean, it is unreal at what some of the stuff that us as ambassadors do and places that we get to go and people that we get to meet. It is just such an incredible way to see the mission in action. And as well as us, we get to be part of that mission. We get to show, uh, showcase our leadership skills and, our, and put the mission into action with our leadership skills. I think that is imperative with this entire experience. And I love every minute of it. Agreed. <laughs> um, the Young Leaders Council. The Young Leaders Council is a diverse group of young leaders of all abilities who bridge the gap between the student's perspective and the staff experience from Best Buddies International in the in the vision. Com comprised of 27 members from around the around the United States and Canada, individuals contributive, <laughs> design and educate unique individuals, I can, initiatives that apply to all aspects of the Black Buddy ecosystem. So I'm going to touch upon the YLC real quick um, on behalf of Michelle and I. Um, so my journey um, in the leadership development started um, with being a state ambassador. 
Um, in 2017, I was invited to attend my first LC. Um, I'm pretty sure that I met Jack and Kelly that same year. Um, I know I definitely met Kelly um, fangirl all day. Um, and then, uh, so I was in ambassador's training most of that weekend. Um, I saw Kelly, I saw Jack presenting. Um, I looked at my program, program manager at that time and I said, I, I need to do what they're doing. I, I think I can kill it. Um, so I, I kept working, kept working, attended my state. Um, I live in Connecticut, by the way, so I, I attended my state trainings. Um, again, I was invited in 2018 to attend LC. Um, Kelly was on fire. Um, I was inspired. Um, by the end of that weekend, um, Ashley Simmons came up to me in the cafeteria my program manager came from behind me. I'm holding a, like a tray, by the way, because I'm about to eat dinner and everyone's just taking my stuff. So I don't like box somebody or excited, like yell. Um, but Ashley asked me if I knew why she was talking to me. And I said, you're Ashley Simmons, uh, Simmons. You're, um, you work for BVI. You're in charge of the ambassadors. And she said, wow, you know my rap sheet. Um, and I said, I, yeah, okay. Um, she said, well, I'd, I'd like to invite you to give your ambassador speech tonight at closing ceremonies. Would you like that? And I just shrilled. I, I just cheerleader shrilled. And um, I just remember, I will always remember that moment. Um, and then I met um, Richard and Patrick as well. They were standing bes um, beside Ashley as well. Um, so that was really cool. Um, Fast forward to 2020, uh, January or February 2020, um, when the YLC applications come out, um, I knew I, I kept having self talk conversations um, that I that I needed to do more and best buddies that that I needed to continue my leadership development. Um, so I applied for for the YLC. Um, it's been my first year has been a, a great experience. Um, I am completely proud of myself that um, I took the initiative to apply to be in, in, uh, to apply to be a co-chair um, so that is that is why I'm, I'm incoming right now um, as I make that transition along with um, the the chair and um, my other co-chairs um, so yeah that's uh, my that's that's my story I'm sticking to it um, if people in best buddies are watching this video via YouTube, um, and you haven't applied to YLC and you want to, don't hesitate, just do it. You know, inside you, you have a story, you know, inside you, you're a leader. You gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come be with us. You, you gotta, you gotta just do it. Great experience and anyone can get involved whether you have an IDD or not. I forgot to add that little tidbit in. So say if you're not concerned that you think you can't do because you're IDD, Jack and I both have IDD and Margo, and we killed it. We're still killing it, and don't ever feel, you know, threatened like you can't do it. And if you need a bike, you can always count on us to be your guide. <laughs> exactly. So when we look at our friendship walk, so the Best Buddies Friendship Walk, what is the Best Buddies Friendship Walk? This is a, the leading walk in the country supporting inclusion for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, also known as IDD. Since 2009, more than 150,000 participants in 60 cities have walked to raise awareness for inclusion, friendship, leadership development, and integrated job opportunities for people with IDD. Funds raised at the Friendship Walks help move our mission forward by funding local Best Buddies programs. It also provides a unique opportunity to see our mission in action at the local level. Every dollar raised goes towards making the world a more inclusive and accepting place. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Uh, oh my goodness. So I can talk so much about the walk. The walk is one of our biggest, biggest fundraisers of the year. We have others, but this is by far 
my favorite ones because they all come together as a community with our friends and family and you can see how much the impact has had on all generations of Best Buddies. So join us as we walk for Best Buddies and, and sharing our mission and sharing our story. Now, the other favorite part of this whole journey is the fundraising aspect. I start early in the year, like I start asking all my people I've come in contact with over the years to fundraise. They already know my story. I talk about it nonstop on social media. Let's change the world for the people with intellectual developmental disabilities. Let me repeat that again, because that I love that message. Let's change the world with intellectual developmental disabilities, for people with intellectual disabilities. So giving that fundamental friendship, leadership, and all those things that Best Buddy provide, all because of fundraising. We would not have these programs if we were not fundraising. So keep that in mind when you're sharing your story. If you need help, ask a friend, ask a, you know, a staff member, things like that. The celebration of it all. It must, it's much more than a walk. It is a party for inclusion, diversity, friendship. Knowing that you raised the money for the program and you worked so hard towards it, sharing the party with your friends. I remember the first walk I ever went to, it was like just a handful, of, like five of us from my chapter, because we didn't realize you're allowed to bring your relatives and your friends and your family. Now, my group alone, each person brings like 20 people. <laughs> so the walk has grown tremendously over the years. It's gotten media coverage. It's gotten radio sponsorship. People are like wanting to come to the walk. My nephew is eight years old. He's been going to the walk since the day he was born. And he cannot wait for the walk to come around here. He's always asking about the people and how that's what, he, what means to him. So I'm hoping all this being said about the walk and the fundraising, I'm hoping to open more elementary schools for his uh, generation to learn about inclusion and learn about people with disabilities. And I'm sure, Jack, you have some great stories about the walk as well. I definitely have a bunch of stories, Kelly, about the walk. Um, over the years that I have been involved in Best Buddies, I can definitely say, I think my favorite memory about being part about going to the friendship walk was the, I think the one year when my best buddy Josie came to the walk and she, we had like our own, like kind of a, like our walk team a couple years ago, it was called Back and Jack. Um, and Josie was involved in it. Um, she came and supported me as I gave my life story. And David Quillen, one of our, one of the people that are actively involved in best buddies, he's actually, um, senior vice president. Um, he was at the walk in Chicago and he was filming me and Josie <laughs> with like a camera and we were and we were like talking about like our friendship. It was just such a beautiful thing to be part of. And I, I highly recommend the friendship walk because it is the best, it's one of the best things about best buddies that you can get. Well done, Jack. And I like to add to not only that the current people who are involved in Best Buddies now, but the walk is also a time for your old chapter president to come back and see their legacy that they have left. Because every year at our walk, I always invite all of our old presidents, all of our old officers. Maybe they can invite their family. And it's just a great way to reconnect. I remember right before COVID, I think it was like 2018, 2019, our walk, I took a photo that is so near and dear to me. It had all the chapter presidents from the last five, 10 years in a row, including David Quillen, a little pat on our back. He actually started our university in South Florida chapter, and he can see how much he has done for us and how far it has grown. So, I just love those memories where you can share it with others who come back and see how far we've all come. So that's one of my other favorite tidbits as well. That's, de party. that's definitely something that to consider, like all the memories that we make from the friendship walk. It's a party for inclusion. So without a party, you gotta have dancing. 
Um, so my favorite memory, I think, of every friendship walk I've ever attended has been the dancing. Um, I got some pretty good moves. My friends have some pretty good moves. My buddy is like always impressed that I'm out somewhere talking to somebody dancing beside them. Um, uh, no one's gotten a leash on me yet, so I think we're good. But I, um, I completely agree um, with Kelly and Jack um, between the fundraising. Um, we constantly need to fundraise because, you know, it's going to be booming best buddies we we constantly want best buddies booming everywhere from an elementary school to a middle school to citizens to e-buddies to leadership development you know canada just um opened up this year for the ylc so um i'm privileged to be able to work with michelle and another individual um that was elected to be on the council from canada um and i i'm just so ecstatic that we're able to keep extending best buddies everywhere so the friendship walk is hype the friendship walk is where the fundraising is um so if uh you're willing find somebody on social media donate to their page talk to them about best buddies just help us be active change and just a little antidote too thank you marla that excellent when you ask for those fundraisers, don't just ask, give them a shout out for, you know, thanking them, email them, uh, mess with them. They like that kind of thing. And throughout the year, if you're doing it every year, like I have, go back to the people who donated to you and ask how they're doing. Because sometimes people think you're only up for grabs. <laughs> if you keep involvement in their life and seeing how they're doing throughout the year, it, they'll be more willing to donate the next year. Um, and with that being said, Michelle, do you have any friends that walk memories or hoping to have any coming up or things like that? I want to leave you out as well. Thanks, Kelly. I, I appreciate you including me. I, unfortunately, we don't actually have friendship walks in Canada, but after hearing all the stories like that you shared, that Jack shared, that Margo shared, like I want to participate in a friendship walk so badly and I'm determined to make it happen in Canada, if not you know, uh, this year, then maybe next year, but for sure, like I, I'm going to make this happen because it sounds like an incredible opportunity to, you know, get together with like-minded individuals where everybody is just passionate about the same thing about inclusivity and friendship and, and having fun. And it sounds like an amazing atmosphere to be in. So I'm definitely determined to make it happen um, here in Canada, because I think that there are so many people that would love to be part of like such an incredible event for sure. So thank you everybody for sharing, um, you know, your personal stories and for, um, you know, being here today. Um, hopefully to everybody who watched or listened, you learned something about, um, you know, inclusivity and about Best Buddies. And uh, if you are interested in getting involved in Best Buddies, um, definitely uh, refer to, uh, you know, those links we mentioned for the international or if you're in Canada or America, um, it's a lot easier to get involved. Um, I believe it's just bestbuddies.ca uh, for Canada, and then it should just be bestbuddies.org for the States. Um, uh, otherwise, feel free to always reach out to the YLC or, or anyone that you know of that might be already involved to uh, find out how you can kind of get your foot in the door to being part of an incredible organization um, that, you know, Best Buddies is. So thank you so much for watching and uh, take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.